Hello and welcome. I'm George Crump, Lead Analyst with Steward Switzerland. Thank you for joining us today. Today we've got a good webinar for you, NAS versus Object Storage, 10 Reasons Why Object Storage Will Win, at least in our opinion. Uh, and we'll go through a bunch of different things. We'll talk about uh, why unstructured data has become such a problem, uh, what exactly object storage is, and uh, 10 reasons why we think uh, it's going to eventually win even in the enterprise. Uh, joining me to help with that conversation, I've invited uh, Tony Barbagola. He is with Coringo. Tony, thanks for joining us today. Well, thank you, George. Pleasure to be here. Good. Uh, so we will, before we get into the meat of the presentation, just a couple of quick logistics for everybody. Uh, first of all, all the audio is through your speakers. There's no dial-in, so you're, if you're scrambling around looking for a phone number, uh, just turn the volume up. Um, a recording of this presentation and others can be seen at any time at storageswiss.com. Click on the webinars button, and you can go there. There's, we have a good 150 or so webinars in our library now, um, so that's uh, very useful for uh, research and things like that. Also, uh, interesting, Tony and I were just talking about the uh, quality of the uh, apps that Bright Talk has. Uh, so there's available for iPad, iPhone, or Android device. You can uh, download the app. It will automatically put our channel in there for you when you download it. Um, you can download the webinars and listen offline, so like if you're on a plane or something like that. Uh, and or you can stream it uh, right through the, the device as well. So that's uh, available to you, and all those uh, would be there for you. Uh, finally, be on the lookout for a polling question. Uh, it helps Tony and I kind of fine-tune the presentation uh, to our audience. Um, you can ask questions at any time uh, by using the Ask a Question button. Uh, we will take all the questions at the end, but uh, as is normal for our webinars anyways, uh, we save a good 15 minutes at the end of the presentation to go through all the different uh, questions. Uh, and then finally, at the end of the webinar, please take a moment to provide the feedback and rate the webinar. That's very, very important to us, and uh, we even give a prize uh, to a person that uh, provides feedback. So I'll give you more details on that when we get closer to the end. Um, for people that don't know me, I am George Crump, the founder and lead analyst at Storage Switzerland. Uh, prior to founding Storage Switzerland, I was uh, vice president of technology at a large storage integrator. Um, there I helped design uh, storage and data protection uh, solutions for a variety of data centers across the United States. So try to bring a lot of practical, real-world uh, stuff to the conversations that we work on. From a storage Switzerland perspective, we are an analyst firm. We're focused, obviously, on storage, but also how cloud and virtualization and, and things like that intersect with it. Uh, we gain knowledge of the markets through product testing, uh, interaction with users and suppliers. Um, we take all of that and, and put it up to our website, storageswiss.com, and, and there you'll find research, uh, you'll find videos, you'll find webinars, you'll find podcasts. Uh, all kinds of different things you can get there. Uh, just go to storageswiss.com. We tend to update it every day with uh, new content, so I, uh, I, I suggest that you come as often as possible. Uh, Tony, why don't you give us some background on you and also Coringo? Sure. Uh, so I'm the VP of product at Coringo. I've been in the industry uh, probably almost as long as George. I uh, started out as a software engineer, and then I've been in product management and marketing roles for uh, large companies and small companies. Um, most recently, I was at uh, Skyera, which was a flash storage company, and uh, happy to be here at Coringo. And uh, Coringo, for those of you that uh, that don't know, um, we've actually been in the business for a little over 10 years. In fact, our founders um, built some of the technology that uh, was a, eventually became the EMC uh, Centera. Uh, solution, content addressable storage, and our roots are actually in content addressable storage. We're, we're now on our eighth version, eighth major version of our object storage environment called Swarm. Uh, we've recently added uh, some integrated search capabilities. We have compliance uh, um, support in the product as well from our, from our older days as a uh, as a content addressable storage vendor. Uh, so that's a quick rundown on Coringo. I should just mention um, we have a significant number of 
uh, real-world enterprise deployments. Um, I'll talk about a couple later in the presentation, but we range from um, providing the infrastructure to cloud storage service providers like the telcos, Telefonica, British Telecom, as well as uh, um, cloud-based uh, companies, content delivery companies, ask.com, match.com, and um, and also large enterprise applications, uh, City of Austin, Department of Defense, to name a few. With that, I'll turn it back to George. All right. Thanks, Tony. I appreciate that. Um, so let's kind of get into the, the heart of the matter here. Before we get into object storage and NAS and everything, let's kind of level set and say, okay, what exactly is unstructured data? Right, because it, it's changed a little bit, right? So at a very, very high level, it's data outside of a database, right? Although there are what we would call semi-structured databases as well. But in general, we're talking about data outside of a database. And for the most part, we've always thought of that, at least traditionally, as files created by users, right? So for most Ameri most people, we're talking about um, office documents, right? So or things like that. So those type of files. It could also be, of course, MP3s and, and things like that. But primarily what I think what we most typically think of when we say files is Excel, PowerPoint, Word, et cetera, uh, uh, with all credit due to Microsoft for that creation. What has changed fundamentally over the past three to four years uh, and is certainly accelerating is the uh, is what we hear the term a lot, the Internet of Things. And, and most data today is being created by machines and devices. And, and what we're finding is that machines are actually far more effective at creating lots and lots of data than us humans ever were. You know, Tony, the other day I bought a brand new uh, Jeep Grand Cherokee. This is not, by the way, an endorsement for Jeep, but it actually is a fun vehicle. Um, <laughs> And it sent, after I had it for a week, it send, sent me an email my first week of ownership on how well I drove that week. And it calculated, apparently I'm not driving that well. I, it also gave me some suggestions for improvement, which I, I immediately now have, <laughs> have thrown the Jeep's emails into the spam folder because I am a perfect driver. But it, it, in general, are you guys seeing the same thing when you're talking to people? Is it kind of shifting from these sort of office productivity files to this sort of Internet of Things data? Oh, absolutely. It's a huge trend. And um <clears throat> I'd say the, the data, or maybe more specifically the metadata, which is data about the data, you know, is being generated from cell phones and cameras. So you can think of that, you know, as sort of on the consumer side, but automobiles, to your point, how about even your online activities? You know, you go in a grocery store these days and, uh, you may then uh, either get an email or even the, um, the cash register receipt uh, magically prints out coupons that they think you're going to want to use based on the uh, pretty fast analysis of your shopping habits. So this is all the types of data now that are being created by machines and are, are starting to really not only be analyzed for, for what's in that data, but also being used and, and, and people, people including applications and, and, uh, and other other types of solutions as well as in the enterprise are uh, taking action on. Right. Yeah, that, that makes total sense. So I, I think that that's the challenge. And, and I think this Internet of Things type of data or machine-generated data is now permeating all types of businesses. I think, again, we used to think of it as something that the cloud guys were worried about. But you know, clearly we see it in energy and gas. Obviously, that the data that my car is creating is getting transmitted somewhere, right? So I'm sure that there's, I don't know if it's actually uh, one of the auto manufacturers that's storing it or if they've outsourced it, but all this stuff is being stored and, and what I would say is increasingly traditional businesses are having to deal with this machine-generated data just as much as anybody else. Yep. So let's talk about where you guys are as an audience uh, on the curve of consumption. Uh, and so our polling question, and there's only one, so I'm hoping we get really high um, participation. But just give us a feel for what you have in the uh, realm of capacity. 
Uh, do you have? And I, I kind of it's kind of hard to know what to pick nowadays. But less than 100 terabytes. Do you have 100 to 500? Do you have 500 to a petabyte? Do you have a petabyte to five petabytes? Or do you have more than five petabytes? So we'll uh, wait and let some of those questions come in or answers come in. Um, so let's see, Tony. First, first shot in here. Um, we've got about 34% uh, of the audience with less than 100 uh, terabytes, which I kind of would have expected. But if you add up the rest of the columns, and actually that 100 terabytes number is now losing. Uh, you know, we're seeing guys in the 100 to 500, the 500 to a petabyte, the petabyte to five petabytes, and the more than a petabyte. These capacity ranges uh, surprise you at all? Uh, not, no, not really. As, as again, I think in the last couple years, the, the need for storage has exploded, and mainly because of what we just talked about in the past, where more and more companies are storing more and more data that they feel is of value to the organization to help them to help them make better decisions. Yeah, and I and I think there's also this tendency now. I think we're learning that deleting data uh, is becoming increasingly difficult to justify, right? Because you never know when you might need that stuff again. So I think absolutely that we're the, the need to keep it as well. All right, well, we had really good participation. Thank you, everybody. We, we, most people, well, not most, but about 34% of you were under 100 terabytes. But uh, if you add up everybody else, we had a lot of people in that uh, in those other categories. We had 26% uh, at 100 to 500, 17% at 500 to 1, 9% at 1 to 5, and 14% uh, of you at over 5 petabytes. So appreciate the uh, participation there. We're going to stop it right there. And uh, that, I think, will help us a lot. So, again, thank you for your participation. So let's talk about some of the challenges that this unstructured data is causing. And, and for you guys that are in that petabyte category on the uh, survey, <coughs> I apologize because you, already, you probably know this full well. Um, but, you know, obviously the big thing is, and the thing that I think that immediately jumps to everybody's mind, is growth in... Um, capacity requirements, right? How much uh, just the, the raw volume of data that needs to be stored. So I, I don't think that's a big shock to anybody. Data is growing, no surprise there. I think what kind of takes people off guard, especially as we move into this Internet of Things era, is the growth in the number of items, meaning the files and what we'll start to call objects, the, the data that these all these devices uh, are creating it is a lot, and they may not individually be very big, but you might be dealing with uh, millions and millions, if not billions, of files in some cases, and many traditional uh, NASs and file servers were never designed to handle that many files. And so we're seeing performance drop off, not because the system is being overloaded from an I.O. perspective, but it just can't handle that many files. Tony, are you guys seeing that as well as, a, as the billions and billions of files instead of the millions and millions of files? Yeah, absolutely. In fact, um, you know, a lot of people think that uh, object storage is, is perhaps about massive scale in terms of petabytes. Uh, we have a customer, Zermed. They provide a medical insurance uh, invoicing service. Um, I they They have probably under a usable uh, petabyte, but, but they have billions of files. And, you know, their challenge uh, when they came to us was, how do you actually protect these files, search them, take action on them? So this is absolutely a trend. It doesn't necessarily have to, have to translate into petabytes and petabytes of storage, but think about billions and billions of files and the strain that puts on a, on a file system infrastructure. Yep. Exactly. Yeah, it's a it's a big uh, it's a big burden. So I think that's something else that that I think takes people off guard. But I think the big one is just the rate at which it's growing. Right. It's no. I think it's no shock to anybody that capacity is growing. But the speed at which it is growing now, the, the how quickly data is doubling, is you know nothing short of spectacular. The, the uh, I was watching. I have a, a teenage. Uh, daughter, and I was watching her and her friends hang out, and they, 
you know, when when I was a teenager, you took a picture and you were careful because it had to go on film and you had to get it developed and you were very careful with, you know, you took like one. They 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 probably took a hundred pictures in five minutes. You know, I mean, it was amazing. And so the 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 rate at which this data is growing is just uh, unbelievable. Are, are, are Tony, are you guys seeing people scale just at, at incredible rates in there right now? Yeah, absolutely. And and again, it seems like it's been in the last two or three years. Um, I mean, and it goes back to the theme that we've been we've been talking about is. Um, you know, by by, and by by the way, unstructured data is you know as as we talk is kind of every every file not in a database, so it goes on beyond you know a, a Word or an Excel doc. Exactly. Um, okay, so let's uh, let's kind of move on. So that kind of I think everybody's like probably most of you guys are like, oh yeah, I get it, man. It's, it's killing me. Uh, but there's one more. There's this sort of traditional mobile and cloud applications are all accessing the same data at the same time. And so it's not it's not the old days where a guy would sit in an office and, you know, he would do work and then go home and stop working. Most people kind of work when they're awake on any waking hour now. Um, Tony, talk about this this uh, particular uh, point here. Yeah, and, and you know, it's a, the, we've, we've heard um, – uh, many many people talk about BYOD into the into the enterprise. Bring your own device, and you know that it started out as uh, something where um, IT I think just ignored it initially. They didn't really know what to do about it, and now everybody's embracing the bring bring your own device. And that you know while it may be your phone uh, or or an iPad or such that, such as that, it, it could also very well be your laptop, which needs to be able to sync on the go. And this is leading to, as as this might be very popular to people, you know, cloud-based uh, document storage services, whether it's uh, whether it's Google or or Box or or other other storage services like that. But the need to access data um, from pretty much anywhere is is becoming the norm. And uh, and and in, in fact, most of you are are likely. Interfacing with object storage today. I mean, Dropbox, it's object storage. It has a sync and share front end, but on the back end, it's object storage. Right. Yeah. Makes total sense. Um, so let's also talk about sort of the impact of all this data. So here's, we, we've got, I think there's no denying that it's growing, that the, the number of files are, are amazing, uh, all, all these issues, but there's also obviously an impact for, uh, you know, average IT guy, right? Uh, and, and so let's talk about some of those. You know, the, I, I kind of group NASs in two classes today. One is what I would call a legacy solution that is sort of the traditional scale-up device that has two controllers and you put as many hard drives as you can on it and then eventually performance goes off the cliff and you go buy another NAS device. Um, and, and then the the second, and, and these really struggle to scale to meet demand. And, and, and you've seen, and I'm sure most people uh, on the webinar here have been in an environment, uh, maybe they've even worked in one where they had uh, one NAS, and then three years later they have 50 NASs or 100 NASs. Right? <laughs> and so uh, that really becomes a management problem all over again. Of course, a solution to that was sort of what I call modern NASs, which are typically scale out in nature, and so some, they, they share some commonality, a little anyways, with with object storage. But um, the, these are generally pretty complex devices. Most of the time, the the, the nodes within the scale out NAS have to be 100% identical from the exact same manufacturer. Uh, in many cases, they have to have the exact same storage capacity, same number of hard drives, everything. And so it looks good at, at you know day one, but in year two or three, when you try to, you still have the refresh problem because you have to keep putting legacy uh, technology in there. Tony, as you look at kind of these two kind of more traditional NAS approaches, anything, any other points that should be made here? Well, I think one of the other interesting things is the the – the environment where uh, NAS is the primary and only storage, um, there's no attribution, if you will, to the value of data. So all the data is being stored in this expensive primary storage. And, it, you know, we've, we've talked to many, many systems and storage administrators that they say that, that their, their, their NAS devices and their primary storage are just becoming the corporate data drunk door because not only are we gathering 
uh, unstructured data from, as we mentioned, uh, IoT and, you know, all this metadata about our customers, but people within the organization are just not deleting anything. They may never access that again, uh, but, but they're not deleting anything, and, and as a storage administrator, they don't necessarily have the authority to go and unilaterally, unilaterally delete uh, files. That information may be important three years from now. So it's that proliferation of of these of these primary storage primary expensive storage devices that uh, is really straining a lot of uh, corporate IT budgets. Yeah, totally agree with that. Um, and so, and I, and I think that the the other challenge is is that uh, you know I, I saw some stuff about three or four years ago where there was going to be some facility to have users set policies on their files and say, okay, you can delete this after three years. Well, that never happened, right? So and we mm-hmm. just got to deal with growth. And and it, my thing has always been, look, at the end of the day, you're probably better just biting the bullet and assuming you're going to keep it all because trying to find the stuff that can and can't be deleted, you might spend more time doing that than you will just figuring out how to keep it all. So let's talk about um, the last impact here is at, at some point you hit the wall, right, that that the cost of storing all this data really becomes an issue. Uh, and then, as we mentioned earlier, the performance of dealing with potentially millions, if not billions, of files uh, also becomes an issue. So I- in either case here, you, you really struggle. And so what we found is we really needed to do something new. And, and, and there was a fair amount of experimentation going on in the NAS market, um, but I think that most people are starting to lean toward object storage as, as a potential solution. Except, Tony, the, I don't know about you, but the number one question I get is, okay, but what is object storage, right? And so let's, sure, let's, exactly. let's, set, that, let's set that table first, and then we'll, we'll kind of tell them why we think it might be the right way. Now, I, I kind of put all these on one slide because I, I think there's some things that um, – we can kind of go into detail over. But it, it, the first thing is that I always tell people is relax. It's not magic. It, it's an alternative way to access data. It, it, and, and vendors like Coringo have done things to make that access uh, sometimes act just like it used to, uh, so you're comfortable with it, and then otherwise, other times access it in what we would call a native object format. Uh, but the transition is relatively easy. Uh, the, the environments we've been involved with where we've helped set up an object storage uh, environment uh, have actually gone quite smoothly. So um, it, it, it becomes ideal for unstructured data because of the way it manages uh, information. And, and, so, and part of that is on the third bullet there. Data is identified by a u- unique identifier instead of a, a, a folder structure, right? In the traditional file system, we create folders and a hierarchy of folders. And if you think about it, we, we do that because in the traditional NAS, we're trying to create the way the human brain works, right? And, you know, before we had computers, we had filing cabinets, and you had letters in front of the filing cabinets, and you alphabetized within the filing cabinet. And you probably had a person full-time whose job was to keep things alphabetized. Right. Um, now you don't, right? And now... So, but a computer doesn't need that. A computer just needs a number. And so the data in an object store is identified by a unique uh, ID. One of the best uh, analogies I've heard about this, and I can't remember anymore who I should attribute it to, but is, is when you go to the dry cleaner, I don't tell them, hey, I need George Crump's clothes. I give them a ticket, and that ticket has a number on it, and they push a button, and then the that big, long conveyor belt thing, which is kind of fascinating, uh, rolls around to the front, and there are my clothes, right? And they don't have to go searching through letters and all that kind of thing. That's at a high level kind of how object storage works. Um, Tony, any other things you would add to kind of explain what an object storage is and how it works? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, again, I, I mentioned this before, but uh, we're probably all using object storage on a daily basis. I think about Dropbox or Box or, or Google Docs. All of those are based on some form of object storage. And some of our cloud customers, Ask.com and Match.com, they run their businesses on object storage, mainly because of some of those points that you mentioned, the, the easy ability to scale out the HTTP-based access. But I think to your bottom point there, enterprises are interesting are interested as well, and uh, absolutely, I think they're starting to see the value of cloud-like storage. No, no, ne- not necessarily having to have a hardware uh, lock-in and um, in, in, in placing 
placing cloud-like or object storage in their data center. Um, great example is uh, City of Austin, who who uploads all their police in-car videos uh, to to Swarm, and uh, that makes them online and accessible for. And to your point here about putting the um, policies into the file system, but one of the beauties of ob our object storage environment is those those videos are definable, are, are accessible for a definable amount of time. And that amount of time is likely based on the legal requirements of the of the government entity. Uh, might be something as simple as uh, uh, a traffic ticket, and that needs to be in the system for three months, and then it gets deleted. Or if there's a robbery or something, that might need to be in the environment indefinitely. Right. Yeah, and I would assume you know certain things go to case and other things don't, so that it'll vary. Exactly. Uh, depending on that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, good. So hopefully that helps with understanding uh, kind of what object storage is. It's certainly nothing to get overly excited about. It's just another way of accessing data. It also uh, comes in a couple of different forms, and I just again to keep it simple, I, I just break it into two. Uh, the first is there's sort of a software only option, right, where you uh, either, well, I assume nowadays you probably download software, You, what I would call bring your own uh, servers and storage, uh, and so you put hard drives in the, um, the, the servers, and then we create a scale-out storage environment and load the object storage software on top of that. So that, that's one option. And I think then the other option is more of an integrated system. And so this would be the vendor. Uh, they, they probably have also written their own software, but they're essentially pre-bundling the hardware for you, so all you do is plug it in. And I'm not saying either one is uh, right, wrong, or indifferent. I think the, the need will vary. Uh, if you really need to drive out costs, you have a lot of existing uh, server type of boxes that you can use. I mean, there's variables there that will uh, help you decide which one makes the most sense. Uh, Tony, you guys are kind of in this in an interesting way. Which What do you see people leaning toward most often, or does it just really depend on the customer? It absolutely depends on the customer. I think there's there are trade offs. We are uh, we typically provide software only, although we have a unique twist in that we run on bare metal. So no, uh, there's no requirement to put a Linux operating system or some uh, some such other uh, um, platform, if you will, on top of on top of the server. Uh, having said that, though, the software only uh, model gives an organization you know, complete flexibility to swap out the old hardware, swap in the new, mix and match, you know, versus potentially the easier deployment of, of a drop-in hardware appliance, which depending on CapEx and, and OpEx requirements in an organization, that may be that may be a, a more optimal way way to go for some customers. Yep, makes sense. So now, now our big top ten. We got to give you the top ten reasons why object storage will replace NAS, and we got to do it in seven minutes, Tony. I think it's I think all right. It's easy. That's like easily about, done. Oh yeah, it's like twenty-eight seconds a, a, a point or something. Um, <laughs> so number ten, the, the the biggest challenge I always hear with with object storage is okay, but I'm concerned about performance. So I think. This might not be take more than uh, this might take a little longer, but it, the first thing is, is that generally you're not going to use these systems as primary storage. They're generally going to serve a different purpose. But there are solutions that can sit on top of these things, like at Veer and Penzora and others, that can give you very high performance for the active data and then leverage object storage as a back end. Uh, I'm sure you guys have seen people kind of putting these sort of combinations together, uh, Tony. Yep, absolutely. Um, that, that's uh, specifically in the case of uh, content delivery, video streaming. Uh, that's that's one area where I've seen uh, the need for sort of a, a high performance or or hardware caching at the front end, if you will. Okay. So number nine, um, it, you know, you can scale capacity almost infinitely, and I know that the scale out NAS guys are going to make a similar claim. I I, I just worry. That the cost to for them to scale to uh, infinity is going to be a lot higher than the cost to scale to scale an object storage system to infinity. What are your thoughts there, uh, Tony? Yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. And and again, depending on the environment, there are scale out um, there are scale out uh, file systems, um, but 
many of those um, technologies still have a limitation on on the file system infrastructure itself, the, the inodes. There are only so many inodes. And then, you know, again, while they can do it, it could become very complex to maintain that distributed file system and those inodes across uh, silos of hardware. Yep, exactly. All right, let's talk about number eight. Um, the, you you kind of hit on this a little bit, um, but, you know, there's yep. really no limit that I know of anyways uh, for a number of files stored into an object store. Is there one? Uh, technically, no. Um, you know, again, not not to, not to sort of uh, push Keringo a little bit too much, but there are many object storage implementations that are built on top of a Linux file system. So while the object count uh, – can scale almost infinitely, the the solution can tend to bog down because at the end of the day, it's still based on an underlying Linux file system or a relational database that has to maintain uh, the object count and the locations of the object um, uh, separately from from the object storage environment itself. But in general, that is the uh, that is the theory. Okay, good. All right, let's talk about number seven. Uh, more cost-effective deploy. So this, this goes to that software case, right? You can uh, use your own hardware. Uh, you can. Uh, I, I'm sure that uh, you guys partner occasionally with integrators that, that can offer the turnkey experience, but it still gives the, the customer that flexibility to not be paying like a premium for hardware that is pretty generic nowadays. Is that is that the right way to say that? Exactly correct. And depending on your performance needs, um, the ability to to mix and match old hardware, smaller capacity drives with newer, more powerful processors and larger capacity drives in the same cluster. Okay. And that's a big one as, as the environment uh, grows and all that kind of stuff. So more cost effective to manage. Uh, you know, this kind of is really talking about sort of that uh, legacy NAS environment. But also even scale out NASs many times have a, a hard limit on the number of nodes that they can effectively support. Where again, you know, there are exceptions, but it, it is uh, a much higher number anyways from a uh, an object storage perspective. So you're dealing with one system instead of dozens of systems. Um, any thoughts there? Yep. Uh, and 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 again, I think uh, typically an object storage environment is. Uh, one large cluster, and uh, at least in the case of, of Swarm, uh, we can add nodes to the to the cluster as long as as long as there's an IP address to associate with the node. We simply boot uh, boot over the network, and and that capacity, both in terms of processor and storage, is absorbed into the cluster. So now you have additional capacity and additional throughput. Perfect. Uh, yeah, here's one we haven't talked about at all in, in, in so far in the conversation is more cost effective to operate. There, there are some specific, assuming the software is tuned correctly, there are some specific power and cooling advantages, aren't there? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and there are some, some general ones, obviously, um, depending on the type of hardware you want, your performance, you could go for lower cost uh, or, or uh, lower power consumption hardware. We actually have a, a, a uh, patented technology called Dark Eyes, uh, which um, automatically, based on, um, again, based on the uh, policy set by the storage administrator, can actually store less accessed data and, and replications of, of, of data, perhaps, on storage, uh, whereby the fact that they are not being accessed very frequently, can the disk can, can power down, and that can be a significant savings in terms of uh, power and cooling. Yep, and plus Darkhive, I think is like one of the coolest feature names ever. It sounds like a super. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, more cost effective to maintain. Uh, again, you know, we've got a lot of redundant parts in here. I, I use the parts, but server or hardware, uh, and and it's also very easily replaced. When when a part fails, it's pretty straightforward to kind of plug a new one in, is it not? Yeah, absolutely. Our our theory is. Um, uh, we handle uh, we handle disk and node failures throughout the cluster, and uh, they are the, a, a disk failure for us is not a catastrophic event. Uh, so we've had many customers where, you know, they've they've gone 
gone away for a couple of weeks in August or, you know, and then when one disc fails, maybe a couple or three start failing. But instead of, and in fact, instead of replacing with like drives, why not replace that two terabyte drive with a four terabyte drive or a six terabyte drive? Easily done. Makes sense. Here's a big one, right? We talked about keeping data for a long time, um, and but you know, at some point the, the theory would be that if I need to recover that data five or six years from now, I want it to actually be readable still and, and have it say what it's supposed to say. So that, that's one of the things I think object storage does is, is does a really good job of that data integrity angle. Now it, it leverages that unique ID that we uh, spoke of earlier to do that, does it not? Yes, it does. Uh, and, and it also is, um, it, it, there's a couple things that go on there. First of all, if there's any kind of sort of uh, MD5 or hashing tables or checksums, uh, but also you, how you've chosen to protect your data, either erase or coded, which is kind of a software version of RAID, uh, or through replication. And uh, the, what, what we actually do in, in Swarm is we have a health processor that, that periodically um, peruses the, the data and identifies any, any uh, corrupted data and will repair on the fly. Typically what a system does is it repairs on access, so that might cause a delay when you're trying to access some data if you're waiting till, to access a particular uh, file or object and, and then finding out that it's corrupted and having to rebuild that object at the time of access. Makes sense. All right, let's talk about number two. We're doing pretty good here. Uh, integrates, uh, it, it, lots of good cloud type of integration here. The, the most of the cloud, as I think as you have alluded to, runs object at some level. So integration with those uh, sort of uh, providers is much more straightforward, correct? Yeah, absolutely. Pretty, pretty self-explanatory based on the, the primary access is uh, HTTP. And then the big one, it's a continuous refreshing architecture, right? One of the things that always drives me nuts is we're talking about storage refreshes or sort of these refreshes, that refreshes. It, the, but the problem is, is that IT is moving too fast to stop everything, buy a new system, migrate all the data over it. And frankly, when you're talking about, I, I forget what the number was, but when you have a, a percentage of people that have um, more than uh, five petabytes of data, how do you move five petabytes of data to anything? I mean, there's not enough bandwidth. It would, it would be a disaster. So having an architecture that can refresh itself, I think, nowadays just becomes critical in this market. Yes? Yeah, absolutely. And now and now throw DevOps into the equation, right, where, where – a lot of your a lot of your storage is being com, com, consumed in in many of these analytics types of applications by a DevOps team, and they don't you know if they're relying on IT, that's a back and forth. Ideally, they don't want to have to worry about how much storage they need; they just want more. Right. Exactly. All right. Well, there's our top ten. We did it, Tony. Uh, thank you right. for your help there. Uh, so, why, before we let everybody go, why don't you tell us a little bit about you guys and, and kind of how you would plug into that top ten? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, really quick on, on Swarm, uh, as I mentioned, we are a complete software appliance, so uh, that means we boot from bare metal. Um, we have we, we've built this from the ground up, so there's no Linux file system, there's no RAID, no LUNs, no relational database required, so you don't need a DBA on staff to run this system. Um, our, the, the, the appliance that is created itself, our software runs from RAM, so that leaves a good 95% of the capacity in each node for your storage. Uh, again, if you're typically an object storage environment running on top of a Linux file system, that Linux, uh, that Linux um, file system takes up a, a, you know, a fair percentage of your disk space. And if you start to, to throw in that percentage into um, thousands of nodes and multiple petabytes of, of storage, that can be a pretty, signif pretty significant um, uh, hit on the overall storage able to be used. Um, on the deployment side, um, we have no need for a front-end proxy server from a storage standpoint. Um, so all of our storage nodes perform all, all functions. We have a nice uh, uh, patented bidding algorithm where um, objects and replications of objects 
uh, or segments of objects are stored uh, based on the excess capacity on a node, either storage capacity or CPU capacity. So the system essentially load balances itself. Um, we are we have a uh, we do have a front end that that uh, uh, provides a web-based user interface, can do multi multi-tenancy metering, access control. So if you're an MSP or an enterprise that wants to do uh, chargebacks or showbacks, uh, we have that capacity built in. Uh, also, we allow access from both HTTP, NFS, SMB, S3, uh, Hadoop. We have a Swift plugin as well. Um, probably the most interesting thing as far as a benefit of object storage over to typical file system-based storage, continuous protection. Data in our object storage environment is always protected. You get to set the protection level. It could be replications of, of your objects, or as I mentioned before, we can do erasure coding. So erasure coding um, uh, separates segments of the objects across multiple nodes and then seg and separates parity uh, segments across multiple nodes. Again, very similar to RAID so that a object can be rebuilt in case a, a, a disk drive or a, or a node is lost. What's uh, unique to Swarm is you can set in the same cluster, in the same domain, in the same bucket, you can have some objects be replicated, uh, perhaps to for a trade-off on uh, easy access, or erasure coded to save storage space. And in fact, you can automate this life cycle of an object through 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 its um, through its uh, duration. Uh, we have a company in Euro in Europe that does streaming video, and you can imagine a new release of a movie, they have 100 replications of that movie uh, to optimize for access. After 90 days when uh, the movie's less popular, they convert that to erasure coding 10.4, and now they've, they've regained that storage space. Uh, so that's, that's key. We also uh, offer uh, feeds and subclusters, uh, and that allows you to – feeds allow you to replicate, asynchronously replicate your clusters off to a disaster recovery location, for instance. Uh, subclusters allow you to specify uh, where uh, data gets placed within, for instance, a uh, data center so that you don't want to place all three replications of an object, if, for example, in the same rack or maybe across uh, geographical locations campus-wide. I mentioned we do proactive recovery, so we have a health processor that will uh, recover data from from failed disks. We'll also shoot up an alert, so at some point in time, you are going to want to replace that, that driver node that's gone down, um, but that's all taken care of, so it's not an emergency event. And I think what makes us in incredibly unique is we have integrated search and analysis into the object storage cluster, so no need to migrate the data out into sort of a big data application like uh, uh, like um, uh, MongoDB or Cassandra. We have a, a complete NoSQL-like <coughs> search engine in the product that's um, available either programmatically via API or SDK as well as um, uh, via our web-based user interface. And I, the last thing probably – uh, worth mentioning, I, I mentioned earlier, we have our roots in content addressable storage, so we have a full compliance capabilities in the product, integrity seals, worm, uh, legal hold, audit trails, et cetera. And uh, the one thing I forgot to uh, mention on this deck, um, and I'll put a link in to another BrightSoft webinar we have, We now that these lines are, are starting to blur between the file system and NAS and object storage, we announced uh, last summer a product called FileFly, which is that bridge to, to file systems. And uh, FileFly essentially lets you thin provision your primary NetApp or Windows file servers. Uh, it's an application that runs on a Windows server that, uh, through policies that are set by the administrator, uh, you can control the movement of files back and forth between primary storage and using Swarm, for instance, for secondary storage. Uh, so you can imagine a policy that says, migrate all files that have not been accessed in the last 30 days off of my NetApp or Windows file or onto Swarm Object Storage. Should a user then a year from now want that file, they happen to double-click on the pointer to that file, it just transparently comes back and they can access it as if it had never left. So that's, the, that's a really quick overview of, 
of Swarm and uh, and Filefly that bridge to uh, NAS and the and the Windows world. Uh, just a uh, just a couple of, of quick sort of business benefits, but obviously we've talked about this throughout the presentation. Using standard hardware, the disk capacity of your choice really lowers TCO. Um, the the product, the solution itself being self-managing, uh, essentially can reduce the amount of storage administrators needed to run uh, the solution. Um, business continuity, you can essentially set however many nines you want of, of durability for your uh, for your data, and it's it's really a question of how many nodes and, and where those nodes are and if they're separated across data centers. So uh, that, with regulatory compliance, uh, really helps to eliminate risk. And then lastly, on the productivity front, automated file management with FileFly and, and the notion of us bringing search into the equation, allowing you to do content organization search and analysis at scale. In fact, you can add any custom metadata uh, to an object when it is uploaded, and that metadata is stored directly with the object. Uh, it's indexed for fast search and, and, uh, and analysis, but it is always stored with the object. So it is, you're never lost. It's never separated into a separate relational database. It's always with the object. So it's really all about stores that adapts to your business. Um, and just, uh, just a uh, really quick, just a couple of, uh, a couple of quick case studies. The DOD uses us for medical images. They take these medical images, interestingly enough, in the field where there's either unreliable or no bandwidth and then move those, uh, Move those servers into the cluster. Those servers are absorbed into into the cluster back at uh, headquarters, and now they have the data. It's kind of like a 21st century version of snail mail, um, but uh, but it's something that that is absolutely required when they're when they're in areas where there is literally no bandwidth. So it's a, essentially a portable uh, cluster that's then absorbed into the main uh, into the main network once they're once they're back in. Uh, uh, back in Washington. So um, they have uh, tens of petabytes of medical images that are stored uh, and accessed uh, through Swarm. They built, a, they built their own custom applications. Many times in, in the object storage world, they've typically built a custom application. Again, Dropbox is a custom application, a web-based app that shows files and folders, but the back end is object storage, as an example. Uh, and then probably the, the la my last slide, um, DDB. Um, in fact, if you buy a Dell uh, laptop, you'll get a 30-day, I think, free trial of DDB, which is essentially an online backup software. Uh, they uh, they use our object storage environment, and you can imagine again a service provider as they get new customers. You want to be able to very quickly and easily add storage and and you know it used to be the case where you'd have to add a giant uh, you know another another uh, box or another NAS server, a SAN, um, you know, another rack. Uh, and now you've, and you've typically had this tiering approach where you've just added, uh, you know, maybe five or 600 terabytes in a new rack, but you're only using 20 terabytes until it fills up. So this allows them to really get incremental with adding storage, reduce their, co their OPEX, uh, and, and they literally only have, one admin managing multiple petabytes and tens of thousands of users. So the, the data protection across their, um, across their data centers also allows them to reduce their risk, and that's really what they're in, in the business for, which is storing, uh, storing other people's data for disaster recovery and, uh, and um, backup. So um, with that, I will turn it back to you, George. Thanks for the, thanks for the time on there. And, uh, I'll, I'll let you uh, take it from here. Thanks, Tony. I appreciate that. Good, good summary. Um, so just before we get to your questions, and you can ask questions uh, by clicking on the Ask a Questions button. We've got a bunch of questions in the queue, so that's good. Um, uh, just as a reminder, there's attachments attached to this webinar, which is why we cleverly call them attachments, uh, that have uh, links and PDFs to uh, various uh, articles uh, that we've written on the subject as well as some uh, additional detail on some of the Coringo solutions. So just scroll down through those and pick out any one you want. Tony mentioned a link to another webinar. 
Uh, we'll add that to uh, this uh, deck uh, here after the on-demand. And so if you want that as well, come back about five minutes from now, and we'll have that ready to go for you. Um, and then lastly, if you will, before you leave, uh, provide feedback. Uh, and you don't have to say this is the best webinar ever, you know, but be honest, but we're just looking for feedback on the webinar, what you thought of it. I also like ideas on, man, what else should we do? We had a lot of attendees in this webinar, and so there's obviously interest here. Is there something else we should cover or something we should go in deeper detail? Put that in that feedback section. You might be responsible for creating the next webinar. Um, the uh, And what we'll do is randomly pick somebody to get a $25 uh, gift certificate. But you can't. The feedback can't be, I want to win the gift certificate, because that, that would not qualify. It's got to be, you know, worthful, uh, worthwhile information. All right, so anyway, so there's attachments. There's the uh, giveaway for the ratings and the um, comments. With those out of the way, uh, let's also put up the contact information in case you need to reach out to uh, either me or Tony uh, or Karingo. It's all right there for you. Uh, Tony, let's go ahead and fire off the first question. Um, has any operating system included a file system to object store agent driver, or is object only going to be usable by custom-built applications? Um, most uh, most of the object storage systems, in, including us, we've added uh, what we call connectors um, to the object storage environment. So, as I mentioned, FileFly uh really really is is a pretty universal use case where object storage can be used as secondary storage so any application that you're currently using in your in your primary storage world um, once the files are are not accessed or immediately after you're done accessing the files they can move back and forth to object storage so so typically the access is through uh, those types of of file system connectors or through S3, which is a very common um, uh, protocol, um, but again, those would be those would be custom applications as well. Um, so, um, with FileFly, I can just continue to use my standard my standard applications, and uh, you know, and, and essentially making use of either NFS or, or SMB as the bridge to object storage. Okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, here's one I get all the time too. Uh, what uh, one of the main objections that I hear a lot, and this is what the question's about. Uh, one of the main objections with Object Store in general is supporting the file use cases. Uh, how do you guys handle that specifically, Tony? Uh, yeah, again, so for the file use cases, um, the, the 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 probably the main one that we've heard. I'd probably say about 80% of our customers have that we've talked to that are strictly in the file world have talked about the expense of adding adding NAS servers. And so again, the, that, that use case I just mentioned, which is using object storage as simply secondary storage for your primary storage environment for those less access files, I think is a is a great start at, at a sort of the killer app for object storage when you have that seamless integration. Um, we've been working with a a regional bank that started out wanting to uh, create a repository for uh, all of their documents uh, at, at, at corporate, and that was that was a perfect use case for object storage, kind of active archive. And then they, they said, oh, by the way, we have 1,500 branch offices that all have a Windows file server. We need to get those th those documents back, and and plus we don't want to have to keep adding file servers in those branch offices. So that's a perfect. Uh, file system use case. There's obviously the sync and share use case that that everyone is familiar with, so that's probably a second one. And then and then there's kind of the transparent NFS connector or SIFS connector, and uh, there's a, a number of of third party organizations that have those connectors that that also go between an Amazon or or Coringo Swarm, etc. Uh, so those uh, those bridges, if you will, are are becoming quite prevalent. Again, I think it's because you're combining the benefits of commodity hardware on the back end with the with the front end um, uh, file use cases. Makes sense. Uh, let's see. What protocol can we use with object storage? And, and this will vary by vendor, won't it? 
Yeah, absolutely. So uh, we support uh, HTTP, obviously. Most of the vendors have their own, quote, proprietary protocol, and the reason why it's proprietary, uh, even though ours is published, we have an SDK, but it's proprietary in that it's not a, a public standard, but they're all typically based on HTTP with extensions. So, for instance, we have extensions. We have an extension um, for life points where – uh, we can specify the, the length of time an object should last in an environment. Imagine a, uh, we have a retail company in, in Europe that sets life points on, uh, they have a e-commerce site, they set life points on their um, images for their sale items so that they don't have to go back after two months and, and hand delete them. So they just go away when the sale is over. Um, so that's, that would be an example of an extension to the HTTP protocol. Um, for object storage. Uh, additionally, S3 is uh, fairly popular, which we support. Uh, we have a plugin for Swift, as I mentioned. Uh, we also support uh, file system access, uh, um, which I which I also mentioned. And lastly, we have an HDFS connector, so we can have a, a direct integration uh, with Hadoop. And again, the, the main reason to do that is um, full durability of your files, uh, erasure coding, uh, on the on the objects or replications of small objects, erasure coded large objects, so you can uh, have that trade off between ease of access and storage footprint. Makes sense. All right. Well, I'll let you prioritize a few more questions here. We've got about uh, three minutes left or so. Uh, I just yep. wanted to one more time while you're doing that, uh, put up our contact information. So if you have any questions, need more information, want to do some more research, uh, websites are there. We've got just search on object on our website. You'll find tons of stuff, and uh, the Kringo site's awesome, too. They have a lot of good stuff on object storage as well. So all that's there, uh, so feel free to uh, make use of those resources. Uh, let's see. If one two-terabyte disk failed and, be, and was replaced by a three-terabyte, is the new space available three terabytes or two terabytes? Good question. Great question. Uh, and with Swarm, the... Uh, new space available is three terabytes. Um, there are several other solutions where you have to replace like disk with like disk or even uh, like nodes with like nodes from a capacity standpoint. We don't care because we have this bidding algorithm. We literally don't care the size of the, of the disks in a node or the performance capacity of the nodes. And the bidding algorithm will take care and load balance across the entire cluster. Sounds good. Um, let's see. So let's go ahead and wrap it there. There's a couple more questions we've got to get to. We'll take those offline for everybody, uh, and uh, we'll be able to uh, get those knocked out. Uh, let's see. As I as I said in the um, at the beginning here, uh, if you'll provide feedback at the end, uh, give us a rating and then some comments, uh, and then we can kind of go through that. Uh, also, like I said, feel free to provide some suggestions on should we go deeper, should we go higher, uh, things like that. So those are all very interesting things to uh, for us to talk about. So please put those in as you leave. Tony, thanks very much for your time uh, today on the webinar. Yeah, thank you, George. And uh, thank you all for joining us today. I'm George Crump with Storage Switzerland. Uh, have a great day.